Professor Pretorius, Professor Duncan, I'll just call you Lorenzo. Yeah. <laughs> when Lorenzo contacted me about the Governance Innovation Week and gave me the dates, I looked and said, this year's World Environment Day, I will make a pilgrimage to South Africa. It is World Environment Day today. And happy World Environment Day to all of you. <laughs> South Africa has been so important in shaping so many lives, not just the lives of people here. If Gandhi hadn't lived here, our independence movement wouldn't have taken the shape it did. I think that his being thrown out of that train in Peter Maritzburg was very useful for freedom for the world <laughs> because he understood what racism can be like. But before that, uh, it was no after that, and it was another September the 11th, 1906, when the compulsory registration on racial identity was being imposed. He said, but we are one citizenry. We are all equal. We will not be divided by race. And that was the first time he practiced what he called Satyagraha, the fight for truth, which then became the civil disobedience with unjust law and brute law that was practiced by Martin Luther King uh, and practiced all over the world. And then, of course, Mandela, what an inspiration for all of us. Um, I remember as a young student, I was doing my PhD in Canada, and uh, every time they brought an exhibit, I, I think Rothman was having an art, sponsoring an art exhibit, uh, we would march. Every little excuse we got, Steve Beagle was killed, we would march. Um, not too many of us, but always present to offer solidarity. And today, it's not so much solidarity in the struggle against apartheid, but the celebration of transcending the logic of governance based on separation. Such an outmoded way of thinking. In a world where we realize that the world is one earth community. In India, we refer to it as Vasudeva Kutumbakam, the earth family. And I think Ubuntu may mean something similar of interconnectedness of one family. All the new sciences teach us that. This is what my PhD thesis was on, non-locality and non-separability. Newton had said everything's made of these immutable particles that were made separate and will stay separate. And quantum theory says, no, they're constantly interconnected. You can't separate them. And int more interestingly, what I find fascinating about quantum theory is there aren't particles anyway. There aren't things in the world. Everything is a potential. Everything is a potential waiting to become what its fullest expression is. And that's what development used to mean. Development was a term of biology. And it referred to the seed becoming, becoming a tree. And, you know, an acorn didn't need to be told by the World Bank and IMF, don't become a palm tree. And didn't need to get aid to do it. I didn't realize there was even something like a World Bank. You know, as a physicist, you stick with your equations, you stay in your mind. I didn't know we were being developed because if there was development, it happens in a self-organized, self-evolutionary way. That's the meaning for us. And it was really behind the eucalyptus tree that uh, I found development. Uh, I was in those days doing interdisciplinary work on science policy um, at the Institute of Management in Bangalore. And all the farms around Bangalore were being planted with eucalyptus. So I said, why are the farmers going so crazy? Why are they planting a monoculture when they have beautiful species like the pongamia, like the different palms, the neem, the tamarind, and of course the food crops? 
And when I started to investigate, found there was a World Bank loan given to replace food crops with eucalyptus, and the name given was social forestry. A word we had framed when we were fighting against monocultures in the Himalaya and this amazing movement of women who were my teachers, they'd never been to university, but I think I've learned so much from them about ecology, about interrelationships, about biodiversity. They said, we're going to hug the trees. You can't cut these trees because these trees are the source of our water, of our food, of our fuel, of our fodder. And the more the forests go, the longer we walk. We won't walk further. And we said, we don't need commercial forest forestry. We need social forestry. Before you know it, social forestry became planting commercial trees on farmland. Now, if you measure the usefulness of a tree according to how effective it is as raw material for pulp, eucalyptus is very good. Always firewood, not very good firewood actually. The, the cooking on eucalyptus leaves that strong smell which is only good when you have a cold. <laughs> but in terms of water, in terms of ecosystem stability, it is so inappropriate outside Australia where the ecosystems can take care of the recycling of the nutrients and the rainfall is right. And I remember soon after apartheid, the Water Resources Ministry in South Africa started to cut eucalyptus trees in order to rejuvenate streams and rivers because of the excessive water demand of the eucalyptus. So what you see depends on how you look. And eucalyptus is fast growing for the pulp industry, but it is actually very slow growing if you're looking at water supply. The separation that is embodied in the word apartheid, of course, became a basis of governance of this country, but is the basis of so much thinking, so much knowledge, which in the short run seems to be very, very dominant and inevitable. But you widen the horizon a little longer and you realize it was put in place very artificially not too long ago in human history and definitely very recently in evolutionary history of the planet. The interesting thing that I find is that governance itself is being replaced by tools. The processes that Lorenzo described aren't allowed to unfold because the two dominant tools that should be a means and not an end of development have been turned into ends where you're not supposed to ask a question, you're not supposed to evaluate, you're not supposed to choose. And these tools are, on the one hand, tools of technology that have evolved from knowledge systems based on fragmentation, separation, mechanistic ideas, and reductionism. And the second set of tools are the tools of what is now called economy, which in Aristotle's time used to be called the art of living, and in its roots has the same roots as ecology. They both are are rooted in oikos, our home. One was supposed to be about the science of the household and the other, the management of the household. But today, in my country, the big debate is environment versus development, environment versus development, environment versus development, uh, when really authentic development of ecosystems, of communities, of nations, needs to be based on taking care of the ecological foundations of our life. And more deeply than that, our very identity, our very being as human beings, because our first identity is as citizens of this earth and this planet. Everything else is secondary. Everything else is removed. The, the tools of separation in our knowledge systems were put in place by what are called the founder, founding fathers of modern science, 
people like Bacon, people like Newton, people like Descartes. Bacon even wrote a book called The Birth of Masculine Time, as if time before that had been feminine. Of course, in India, Kal is Kali, and she is circular time. She's the one who decides when eras will dissolve and new eras will emerge. But for Bacon, the birth of masculine time was based on the idea that it's through the domination of nature, sometimes he even referred to raping nature, as the best way to know the nature of things betrays itself more readily under the vexations of art than in natural freedom. And you can't get knowledge merely by exerting a gentle guidance over nature's cause. You have to have the power to conquer and subdue her. People like Boyle said, you've got to get rid of Native Americans who hold the idea that somehow that nature is sacred. She's Mother Earth. And because it's such an Im impediment on man's empire over lesser creatures. And of course, the lesser creatures are not just the biodiversity. The lesser creatures become the part of humanity that happens to be other cultures, a little colored with a little richer pigment in our skins, women. We're all dissolved into lesser creatures. So the domination of nature went hand in hand with all of the intellectual um, architecture of colonialism. And that has then set the foundations of so much that universities teach. I always feel grateful that I didn't study any of this when my mind was still forming in terms of categories of thought. I kept myself busy with quantum theory. And later in life, you, you, read, you read Locke, and you read Hobbes, and of course you read Bacon. You say, where were they coming from? The interesting thing with Locke, who writes about property, is that he was writing in England when the enclosures of the commons was taking place. But there isn't a line about the enclosures of the commons. Everything is contextualized in North America, in the primitiveness of the Native American, and the fact that it is all right to appropriate. Because interestingly, by then, there was capital, and there was land, and there was labor. And only capital had creative power, somehow connected to a spiritual domain. He says, it's not the labor of the horse or the woman or the person who's working your land who generates value, but labor in a spiritual form. And labor in spiritual form is labor done by capital, a construct. And part of what innovation in our times has to be has to be to recognize that so much of our intellectual domination is on the basis of fictions. We've become so smart at creating fictions and then being ruled by fictions. Capital is one of them. It, we used to talk about money. I was trying to understand where did that come from? So I read Latin roots caput basically referring to how many cattle you owned. Real stuff. By the time the new paradigms are laid out, it is the creative force. Nature is reduced to land as a commodity, and human beings, creative, intelligent, brilliant, are reduced to labor as an input. This hit me, I've been working on agriculture for 30 years, and for very long I've been sensing that the productivity assessments in agriculture are so misguided because a productivity calculation should be based on output per unit input. And in any 
issue, uh, and this was presented by Bruno in the earlier workshop. Um, agricultural activity is multifunctional. You're looking after the soil, you're looking after the landscape, you're producing fuel wood, fire, all kinds of nutrition, you're creating culture, you're cultivating community. Output isn't just commodities. And input definitely is not just labor. All of the productivity is based on how many human beings could produce how much tons or quintals of food. The other day I was giving a lecture for the Goa, uh, Chief Minister of Goa, and before me a very important, you know, the, the biggest uh, IT firm, um, its founder, Dr. Anaramurti, got up and said, oh, you know, if it was all left in our hands, India would have ever-increasing GDP. Uh, the problem is we've got too many farmers. And um, low agricultural GDP is lowering the overall GDP. So the thing to do is reduce the denominator. And that's when it hit me. I said, there are people who think of other people as just denominators that can be reduced. And I had to respond to Mr. Narayan Murthy, and I said, sorry, there are brothers and sisters. There are fellow citizens. And even if you assumed you could reduce them, because you can't reduce 700 million overnight, and I said, they, they need not just the dignity of equal citizens, but more importantly, I think something's wrong with the calculation where people are reduced to an input, because that's a raw material. When creative work should be an output of any system of production that works for people. As much as land is not an input, because fertile soils are an output of good farming. So we've got our inputs wrong, we've got our outputs wrong, we took the financial subsidies and didn't even count them, $400 billion a year, 400 billion globally. In my country, 60 billion, 300,000 crores. In Europe, half of the, cap, of the European budget is cap subsidies. And we call it productive and it has to be kept afloat with this huge amount of tax money. 10 units of input produce one unit of output in industrial farming and we call it productive. I'm so grateful Lorenzo wrote the book on GDP and I immediately accepted when um, Zed asked if I would do a promotional blurb and thoroughly enjoyed reading it, thank you. No wonder so many people want to buy it. Um, but GDP was created for the war, to mobilize resources for the war. And as my sister and friend Marilyn Waring, who was the youngest uh, MP in uh, New Zealand, when she wanted to have budgets for women and children, she was always told no money. And then they wanted the next submarine and the next fight jet, and there was always money. So she said, I must figure out how the country is rich when it comes to arms, and we are always poor when it comes to taking care of women and children. So she started to do her research, went all the way to the UN, and wrote, finally wrote the book, If Women Counted, found out the calculation is done on the basis of a fictitious production boundary. If you produce what you consume, you don't produce. We've just had elections in India, and of course all kinds of gurus are coming out to tell Mr. Modi what he should do. One of them said, 93% of India's economy doesn't contribute to GDP. 93%. 93% of the economy can't get counted, and the number has to be defended, even though people can be wiped out. I think something's wrong with a number that can be manipulated so badly. And of course, the UK just, at the Financial Times of the other day, sex, drugs, and GDP, Britain to gain 10 billion pounds to boost its accounts just by taking cocaine trading and prostitution into the national accounting system. Of course, meantime, the women who work at home doesn't count, 
and the coca farmers of the Andes, for whom coca is a sacred crop, are being criminalized and sprayed on with Roundup herbicide to wipe out the coca. So the more wars we have, the more crime we have, the more disease we have, the GDP will keep shooting up, the more our societies will disintegrate, the more we will see what's happening to so many parts of the world. They'll just tweak the GDP and it'll keep rising. Meantime, life is threatened, not into the far future. Now, the climate change phenomena and maldevelopment in my region in the Himalaya, 20,000 people killed in the floods of 2013. In 2010, 10,000 people killed in the uh, Indus Basin because of floods. The <coughs> deaths due to drought don't make so much um, news, uh, first because they're slower, and a drought can't be captured on the one second camera. A flood can. So we have to go beyond growth. And I think that is one of the most important innovations taking place in our time. That countries, academics, intellectuals are saying, and individuals, I know so many young people, my own son, making lots of money in Mumbai as a professional photographer. And one day he says, well, I'm earning so much to spend so much to kill myself. On our farm in Dehradun, where we do a lot of teaching and training and we'll be offering a one-month course on the A to Z of agroecology, I get the richest bankers, we get the poorest peasants also. But bankers and IT people, they're dying of heart attacks at 30. And now they're realizing all that money doesn't make for your life. I advise the government of Bhutan the prime, late, last prime minister asked me to help in the transition to 100% organic. And this March, we organized a mountain ecosystem transition. It's in the Thimpu Declaration. It's amazing because the scientific evidence from around the world is clear. Ecological systems produce more food, give you more resilience. Biodiversity is more productive. A monoculture of the mind has always seen biodiversity or diversity of every kind as a problem that must be removed. After all, that's what apartheid was, where diversity was seen as a problem rather than a strength. But in agriculture too, that monoculture dominates. So we have the paradigm of separation that creates, converts diversity into hierarchies creates artificial boundaries, and it's given us the three mega crises of our times. The first, of course, is the ecological crisis, climate change, species extinction, the disappearance of water, you know that as much in South Africa as in India. Um, of course, for, for the elite, they'll always be able to redirect a river get the last few clean aquifers and put it into a bottle like this. Um, twice I've had to help women in India who were dealing with an artificial water famine created because of Coca-Cola setting up a plant. And they'll always put on the bottle manufactured by. They don't manufacture water. <laughs> they just put in tube wells and mine it and steal it. And the women again have to walk longer. I, I've figured out that 10 miles is the tipping point of women's walk. When women of Chipko had to walk 10 miles, they said enough is enough, we've got to protect the forest. When the women of Plachimada had to walk 10 miles, they said enough is enough, this plant must shut down. They called me in 2002. By 2004, the plant was shut down by women. Late my lama, a tribal woman, led it. The village had only 100 people. But coming together, staying resilient, never giving up, bribes were attempted, everything was attempted, and then we had a court ruling, bye-bye. 
uh, we had a court ruling that said water is a commons. The state does not have the right to hand over water to a company, and this is not the property of the company. If they want to run the plant, they can run it, but they can't take the water. It's a bit like Shylock being told, you can't get your pound of flesh if you shed blood. Um, so the ecological crisis, water, but land, both the destruction of land, of fertile land. This morning we had a presentation by Simon about how China's farmland is so toxic they can't really eat the food from their own land. But the land grab that we are witnessing. And then the toxics all over. Rachel Carson tried to wake us up to it with Silent Spring. We've had Bhopal 30 years ago where a pesticide plant leaked. And I remember when I was trying to figure out why do we have all these chemicals in agriculture, I was also trying to figure out why there's so much violence attached to the agricultural model that's called agricultural development. I realized all these toxics had come from the wars. Made either the nerve gases, which are so many pesticides, were made for concentration camps. The early experiments were done in concentration camps. And then later for the wars. If you look at the five big players who want to control seed of the world, they were the ones who control agrochemicals of the world, but those agrochemicals are war chemicals, and they all were born in that period of the war. So it is no accident that for them, Designing products, uh, designing paradigms to kill has just become second nature. They don't think twice about it. Then you have the economic crisis. The economic crisis which we've always felt in our parts of the world because of the poverty and the dispossession, but which after the 2008 collapse, the young people of America called the 1% against the 99%. And when the collapse happened in Spain, the indignados came up. But I think it's more than that. It is not just about economic inequality as polarization of wealth as measured in conventional terms. I think the deeper issue is that all the resources we need for sustaining life and sustaining livelihoods are seen as the next place for profits and capital accumulation. My own work in agriculture, besides being triggered by Bhopal and the Punjab crisis, was then made into a firm commitment to protect seeds, start Navdanya, when I heard the same poison companies talk about how now they had to on the seed because they weren't growing fast enough. They were too small. They had to become five. And the only winners would be those who deployed the highest amount of genetically modified organisms in order to take patents. They were very honest in 1987. They said, we've got to do genetic engineering because it's the only way to claim a patent and claim life forms and seeds is your invention, because at the end of the day, the idea was to collect royalties from that which was a commons of the people, the seed. And that's the day I decided, I'm going to give the rest of my life to defend this commons, because it is about life. Just very quickly, let me mention what has happened in the years since 1987 when I started Navdanya. Positively, we've created 120 community seed banks. Positively, we have fought against biopiracy, which is based on another kind of hierarchy, where you first create artificial disciplines and artificial experts, and then you just steal the knowledge of the people and say, I invented it. I invented the use of neem for pest control. I invented basmati, which is this aromatic rice from my valley, or an old Indian wheat that doesn't contribute to gluten allergies. Monsanto claimed to have invented it. And here in South Africa, the San used a plant in the desert, which was patented 
and they use it because they have to walk miles before they find the next food, Pfizer patented it for an anti-obesity drug. And they actually argued in the courts, at the European Patent Office Court, saying, no, these primitive tribes could not have known anything. And this discounting of the knowledge of people, who for centuries have lived in that ecosystem and with that biodiversity, is now today one of the biggest sources of growth of capital. In those days, the industry used to say, if we can force every farmer to buy seed every year, we have a trillion dollars of profit right there. Just in the case of takeover of cotton in India, it's an outflow of 200 million in royalty every year. The price jumped 8,000%, half of it which goes as royalty. The technology doesn't work too well either to control pests, so the farmers have to still use pesticides and more, 13 times more. The result is a debt trap about which Susan has educated us so well over the years. And indebted farmers who've never faced such a situation end up taking their lives. There have been 284,000 farmer suicides in India since seed monopolies were institutionalized. Under this fiction that A, the corporation is a person. The corporation is a piece of paper, a contract of limited liability. And we give them personhood. And this non-person who's been given personhood is now running the governance of the US where Supreme Court orders and says in the Citizen United case, blocking the power of corporations to contribute to elections, which means steal democracy, is taking away their free speech. They even have speech. <laughs> and then, of course, the best is this non-person has a mind which can create intellectual property and take away the real commons of real people that sustain them. The land grab, in a similar way, if, I, I was very, very surprised by, uh, the National Geographic was making a presentation about their ne new campaign on food and you know, their latest issue has eat on it and, on this, they're nice pictures, but they also have a website. And on the website, and this was a presentation the creative director was giving, they had Africa. And they said, Africa is medieval. And I can't understand that. How can an Africa of 2014 be put into the medieval age? It's contemporary. It exists today. Africa is medieval, it has villages. And then they had another slide showing how Africa should look like this to become modern, and it was just monoculture, oil plant, plant plantation. That's what's justifying land grab, jatropa, oil palm. The first excuse is we've got to grow more food. Justification is that capital, which today becomes investment. It's, it's, it's interesting to map. This would be a very good intellectual exercise to see how the terms of economic power the vocabulary changes from money to capital to investment today. And they're always doing us a favor while they steal all our resources. Investment is always doing a country a favor. And I do think we need to revisit the new power of creativity investment has been given. Now, the third big crisis that this has created is the crisis of political instability. When I wrote the book on the Green Revolution, I wrote it because Punjab, the land of prosperity, the land of the Green Revolution, which Bill Gates wants to bring to your continent now, um, under the Alliance for the Green Revolution in Africa, which was basically a mix of chemicals and seeds adapted to chemicals, because native seeds reject the chemicals. They do a satyagre. So we don't want your chemicals, they lodge. They said, no. So they had to make these dwarf varieties, shrink the straw, change the proportion of biomass in the grain and the straw. And the Green Revolution was given a Nobel Peace Prize. 1984, two days ago, was the anniversary 
the army had to be sent to the Golden Temple because Punjab was such a volcano. 30,000 people were killed. That is six times 9-11 of New York. And I said, if this was supposed to be about peace, the Nobel Peace Prize, why are 30,000 people being killed? So I went back to Punjab where I had done my MSc honors in particle physics. I said, it was a peaceful place when I studied. So what's gone wrong in such a short time? And I realized it was a combination of the fact that the resources were degraded, soils were dying, the water had been mined. Nowadays, there's a new cancer train that leaves Punjab. But most significantly, the farmers rose because after that initial subsidy was withdrawn, the system became totally unviable. Farmers were getting into debt. They were getting angry. And they said, if what we grow, can't, we can't choose. How we grow it, we can't choose. The price at which it will be sold, we can't decide. When our rivers will irrigate our farms, we can't decide. This is slavery. The army was sent on 3rd of June. On 4th of June, the farmers were going to blockade the supply of grain to Delhi. A connection that has never, ever appeared in the media. I know it because I was in touch with the farmers. So you get narratives changed. Every major crisis of our times is linked either to food or to land. Even the splitting up of Sudan. Egypt started with people marching with bread in their hands. It was about the food price rise. In the early days of the Syrian problem, it was farmers, peasants marching to the capital because their crop had faced, failed and they needed relief. Before you know it, it's turned into religious warfare. And Punjab too, it was presented as if it was about six, and Hindus, it wasn't. So there is a very clever deflection of conflicts that are development conflicts, conflicts that are resource conflicts, conflicts that are about imposition of decisions, and they're always conveniently turned into a problem created by diversity with people killing each other, and then the arms trade takes over, and the GDP keeps growing, and we know what the downward spiral is about. Now, in agriculture, when, when you see these, the, the science of separation and the economics of separation joined together in the way we produce food, and the way we process it, and the way we distribute it, all these multiple crises get amplified. 75% of all ecological problems on the planet have their roots in industrial farming methods. The United Nations Leipzig Conference on Plant Genetic Resources 1995 assessed 75% species destruction in agricultures because of monocultures of industrial agriculture. 75% is the amount of water industrial systems use. 75% of soil degradation, soil erosion, is because of systems of farming that didn't take care of the soil, which should be the first method in farming. Um, and 40% of all greenhouse gases come from an industrial globalized method of production of food. Some of it is fossil fueled from either the production or the distribution and food miles. Large part is nitrogen oxides, which is 300 times more destabilizing for the climate, and methane from factory farms. And my book, Soil Not Oil, which I'm leaving a copy with Lorenzo, was written in the lead up to Copenhagen to basically say, here's the big piece, 40% damage, and a bigger solution in alternatives that work. But 75% of the diseases and malnutrition of the planet is because of the design of the food system. A billion people not getting food is not because the earth said, I won't give you food, or peasants weren't capable of producing food. It's because a system that produces profits and commodities doesn't produce food. And because of the way this system must thrive on degrading food, we have the diseases of obesity, 
of diabetes with the toxic chemicals, we have the cancers. I mentioned the uh, cancer train leaving Punjab. The interesting thing is only 30% of the food that people eat. Till recently, what was calculated was what is traded, what gets onto container ships and is traded by the cargills of the world. And of course, it looked like the corporations feed us. The United Nations FAO started to calculate who produces what people eat. Turns out 70% of the food that people eat comes from small farms. And if you add to it the gardens, kitchen gardens, community gardens, which is, in my view, one of the most important innovations of our times, where we realize that urban areas could be food producers, it would be 80%. When you look at corn and soya, which are the most rapidly explain, uh, expanding grain crops, only 10% is eaten by human beings. 90% goes for biofuel to drive cars or to torture animals. I don't say feed animals, because those cows have four stomachs. They wanted grass. That's why they're called herbivores. Um, they aren't called bean eaters. So in this most basic need of ours, the need to eat, to be alive and to be healthy, and the fact that the majority of people are engaged in agriculture, here's the single biggest innovation to change the agriculture model. And that's what we've been trying to do through Navdanya. Not that difficult. The first thing you need to do is shift from a model of science based on killing people and generating war chemicals to a model of science based on the relationships of nature, which is called agroecology. To move from fragmentation to integration. Because everything's decided, the, the, divided. The soil is in link to the plant, is in link to our health. Climate change is in link to biodiversity. Everything is kept in its boxes, but everything is connected. And of course, the single biggest innovation is to shift from monocultures, both in the mind as well as in land use, as well as in consumption, to diversity as a central organizing principle of governance, of production, of consumption. I mean, the UNESCO has on its um, heritage list food Italy because they consume more diversity than the rest of Europe. But they don't even count the diversity available in the rest of the world and how diverse our diets can be if we decide what our diets will be. Poor South Africa is being told you will eat GM corn and I know the movements are huge out here and I think you need freedom to have healthy food. You need freedom to choose the food. You need freedom, your farmers need the freedom to have their own seed, which is why we create seed banks. We can produce more food, better food, at lower cost, through the innovations of biodiversity intensification and ecological intensification. So far, that industrial military model gave us chemical intensification, capital intensification, and intensification of profits of a few companies. If we intensify the food chain to the level of the planet and the people and replace these linear flows with circular flows, we rejuvenate nature, have more fertile soils, have more biodiversity, more water in our streams and our wells, but most importantly, more creative work, meaningful work, dignity for our people. The small farmers with whom we work by conserving their seeds, using ecological agriculture, defining the market from the local to the national, earn 10 times more than the farmers growing GMO cotton or hybrid rice or hybrid corn or soya bean. So there is wealth, but this wealth will be circulated to remove poverty. It will not fly off to Cargill in uh, Minnesota and St. Louis, Monsanto. 
Right now, the chains of money flow are so centralized, and they go in one direction because of that old definition that capital creates. So all the money can flow out. What we've done in Navdanya is not just innovate with systems that will work to remove hunger and poverty, but more importantly, to create climate resilience in our times. We realize that these innovations are delivering. The challenge is to make the innovation scale up to the level of governance and scale up to the level of poverty. In any case, if we carry on, I do a simple equation, if only 30% comes from a system that's destroying 75% of the planet, you take it to 45%, you'll have no planet to live in. There's no agriculture on a dead planet. There's no profits on a dead planet. There's no people on a dead planet. So innovation today is an imperative. It's not a luxury. We will either innovate to sustain life for the planet and people, or we will fail to innovate and be very rapidly thoroughly extinct.